Hey guys, Julian here. This video is a recording of the first workshop I did for parametricism using Grasshopper 3D. So if you attend the workshop and you have the files and some notes, then hopefully you'll find this helpful. If you couldn't attend the workshop, then the files are in the description below and that'll help you, that should help you follow along with the video. If there's any part that you find confusing uh, and you would like me to elaborate on it, please leave your question in the comment section below and I'll get to it in an upcoming video. So let's get right into it. Grasshopper, um, you have your command line and you're going to just type in grasshopper to launch. Right? Once you do that, Grasshopper will load. And how I like to set it up is uh, you don't necessarily need to do anything in Rhino while you're working in Grasshopper. You can, and I'll, I'll get into that. But for now, um, I'm just going to have this set up where I have a pretty good view of the origin and the axes and where I can see Grasshopper through the half or more of my screen. Um, okay. So a quick look through through Grasshopper. Here are the most recent files. All right, you can open them. You can open them right up. Um, you have your toolbars. Right. Uh, if you have the standard Rhino, you should have up to display. Some of you may have Weaverbird. Sometimes it comes um, depending on what version of Grasshopper you download. Uh, you might have Weaverbird. So for today, you're just going to need like um, the the standard toolbars. So here are your toolbars, and they're separated by parameters, right? So everything in here either interprets or kind of carries uh, data through, right? And we'll get into that a little bit more later, but basically if you're working with surfaces or if you're working with meshes or anything like that, um, this is kind of uh, where you would go to uh, to also make sure that uh, your data lists are carrying through. So data list is something I'm going to have to explain on the board too because it's... Uh, Got a little bit lost at the last class with that. Uh, your math toolbar, right? That's just gonna edit all any kind of values, right? If you need to divide or add uh, your results, or you need to construct a range of numbers that are uh, possible numbers to create your geometry and that sort of stuff. Also, you have your scripting tools. So if you learn programming through C Sharp, Visual Basic, or Python, you're able to directly alter Rhino script through Grasshopper. Then you have your sets. Sets basically um, modifies or creates uh, lists of information uh, that you can then apply. So we'll get into that too. Vectors are forces. So forces that can maybe uh, be applied to uh, distorting curves, um, orienting surfaces, and that type of stuff. Curves is simple. It's just curves. And so are surfaces, but I have to explain the difference between surfaces and mesh meshes. So, a surface is interpreted in Rhino through a UV division, right? So every surface has kind of uh, divisions in two directions, right? And that's kind of how the, uh, the surface is kind of modified. So if you take a flat rectangle, can everyone see over here? Okay. Okay. So you take a flat rectangle, right? and you want to stretch it out one way more than another, then that would mean you have like two divisions in this direction and then put it in the other, for example, right? You, if, you were to do a, <coughs> if you were to see this from the side of you, it would just be a line, right? But if you were to see a surface that were a curve, that's how you start understanding how the UV applies. So a surface like this would simply mean that these points are raised, right? And then the curve, the surface is created in black. Can everyone get that? Yeah? Okay. Now, a mesh uh, seems more complicated, but it's actually much easier for the program to process. So once you get some more intricate data, you may want to start working with meshes. And meshes are defined by uh, points, connecting curves, and then a face. Right. Meshes, um, we're not going to be working with meshes today, so don't worry about that. Uh, the intersect toolbar, this is basically any sort of intersection you're doing across meshes and objects, curves and points, and uh, etc. Transform, you can uh, transform meshes and shapes 
um, scaling them, shearing them, and so on. And uh, display, we don't have to get into that uh, today. But it's basically you can add textures, you can add like uh, different visuals to the stuff you're doing in Grasshopper. So how we're going to start is um, we're going to start by creating a grid and then generating objects with those grid points as an origin point for every object. And we're going to create values so that that object is unique to every point. Does everyone get that? Yeah? So I tried explaining this as I was going through the program, um, but I found that it's a really complicated or, or I got a lot of confused faces and I had to go over it a couple times. So I'm going to do it on the board this week. If I raise this, do you still get the glare? Or is it uh, with the lights now? Is it still glary? Still glare? All right, let's just go through it real quick. And I'll bring that down. Uh, back down. So I'm going to go with a construct. Oh, also, up here on display, right? Can you guys see that? Up there? Yeah. Under display, I have draw full names selected, right? That's because. Uh, here on your canvas, right? This is where all your components and all your information is going to. If you double click, you can just search for whatever it is that I'm using. So I'm going to start with a construct point. Oh, sorry. Should have waited, I guess. To erase that. So I'm going to start with a construct point, right? And that's basically asking for three inputs, right? An X, a Y, and a Z. So what I'm going to do is, from my sets, I'm just going to create a series. What I mean by the draw full names is that if you double click here and search for the title that you see here, you're going to get that component, right? Maybe if you're working on a Mac or if you uh, installed a uh, an earlier version of Grasshopper, maybe the components might be named differently, but the icon should remain the same. So I'm going to use a series, right? And a series uh, basically determines a starting value for your first um, whatever it is that you're modifying with, right? So you define a starting value, a value from which it's going to increase every time, and how many times it's going to increase, right? So to explain that real quick, if using examples, if I start with five, right? If I start with taking five steps, right? And then every additional step I'm going to take, every further operation is going to be two more steps, right? Then the next one's going to be 7, the next one's going to be 9, the next one's going to be 11, right? And so if my count, that you see here, if my count is 5, then it's going to go from 5, right, to 7, to 9, to 11, to 13, to 15, right? Um, you for the camera? Yeah. Yeah. So the reason why this is going to start to get complicated is because if we have six values, right, to apply to six points, it's pretty easy, right? Six to six. But what happens when we have those six values and then we want to apply six values uh, not to those six points now, but we want to give all six values to every point, right? That would end up with 6 times 6. So here's what I mean. We'll just start with 2, right? And we'll use 2 for our step also. And then I'm going to use 5 as the count. So I'm going to connect series to Y, right? And so basically, you can open up a panel to always see. Um, what the outputs are, right? So this is what I was saying, right? We're starting at 2, and then every step is 2. So the next one's 4, 6, 8, 10, and my count is 5. So I end up with a result of 5, right? So this is what I want to explain to you, is that if I were to now move these 6 points, right? And I can and now move also, you can hover over every component and it'll tell you what it needs to function, right? So if I hover over motion, it's going to give me a title, it's going to give me a description, 
and it's gonna give me the description, the actual value that it has, right? So the title here is motion, it's a vector, and you can always kind of make an educated guess, right, on how it's interpreting data. So if we look down there, I don't know, it might be too small, but it's saying uh, one locally defined value, 0, 0, 0, 10, right? And if we remember from algebra, coordinates, x, y, z, right? So we can assume that the default motion is in the z direction and that it's 10 units in the z direction, right? And we can see that because if I click on move, the dots that are moved in the z direction are turning green, right? So they're selected over here. Okay, so this is what I was getting at before. Is that if right now I have five values and five points, right? So pretty easy. So right, so point number zero, also these numbers right here, zero, one, and three, four, those are index numbers. That will become important later because basically the point that has an index of zero is gonna receive the number that also has the index of zero, the other one, right? So here we have a point, and we're giving it five inputs, right? Creating five points, yeah? So if I were to create, if I were to uh, plug in this list again, so we move in a different direction, then two would go to this one, right? Four would go to one, to six would go to, right? But what if I want all of these to go to zero? All of these to go to one. All of these to go to three, and so on, right? But, so that then you're talking about how the data is carrying through, right? And how you're kind of applying these values to the operators and the things that you're doing. So, whereas right now, each point is only receiving the value of 10 for the z-direction. If I were to create another series, I'm just going to copy-paste this one. If I copy-paste this series and I add a, we're going to go in the x-direction instead. So I'm going to type in x, and unit x defines the x-vector. So uh, now that's how you kind of can uh, create a force, right, or a vector in a direction. You have an axis or a direction defined by, in this case, just x, the axis x, and then you have an amplitude, right, what the program calls an amplitude, or a, an amount of force in that direction, right? So in that case, that amount of force or um, amount of direction is being applied just to moving this. So let me clean this up a little bit. So does everyone, does everyone get what's happening here? Yeah, just a little bit. Forward closer together. Can you see that? So what's happening right now is that here I'm defining uh, five different values, right, for this point. So then I'm getting five points, right? All with a different y coordinate, right? With a y coordinate of two, a y coordinate of four, of six, of eight, and of ten. Then I'm moving, right? The each point. I'm moving each point. But out of here, I'm getting the same values, and it's applying two to the one that's already moved by two. 4 to the one that moved by 4 in that direction, right? So this this point right here, I'm going to click here. The green ones are the ones that have been moved twice, right? Or, sorry, the ones that have been moved. This one I only defined an axis for. So we can understand that here, this one has the y value of 2 and also the x value of 2. And we see that on the grid, right? This one is index number 1. And it has the y value of 4 and the x value of 4. Index number 3, uh, sorry, number 2 would be this one. Value of 6 in the y direction, value of 6 in the x direction, right? So what I was saying is 
I want this one that has been moved in the y direction or has a y coordinate of 2 to move 2, to move 4, to move 6, to move 8, and to move 10, right? To create a grid. So in order to modify that, right, in order to give every value to every point, you do what's called grafting, right? And you can either do that from the data end or from the object end, right? In this case, I'm going to do it from the data end to not mess with how the points are already behaving, right? So what that means is I'm going to go to unit vector here. I'm going to right click over the output, right? And I get some options for the output. And I'm just going to hit graph. And what that's basically doing is applying, you see now how this is split, right? That wasn't like that before. It's a single list of values being applied to a single list of points, right? Now it's, yeah, now it's five different lists of, point, of values being applied to uh, each point. So it's creating a new list from each point. Does that make sense? Yeah? Okay. So if I were to create a polyline right now, it would only do it through each row, right? You understand why? Because each row is its own list, its own separate list. Now I could do the opposite of a graph and I could flatten and that would basically eliminate that separation between lists. So as I flatten, then you see that it becomes one huge list of points. And that the last point in the in one list then carries on to the first point of the next list, right? And my poly, my polyline then becomes like that. Seeing some confused people. Are they okay? Should I explain it again? Yeah. Okay. So before I flatten, did you get the grafting though? You understood the grafting part? Okay. So. When I grafted, I kind of made it treat. I made the numbers kind of treat themselves differently. I can represent this another way. You can use param viewer, and this is good when you're like, you know, when in in what moment you have like six points, and then after two operations you have like 288 points, and it doesn't make any sense. Then this is a good resource to use. Yeah. Well, the series is only creating a list of numbers, right? right. Exactly. So the coordinate uh, uses numbers uh, to interpret uh, right where it's supposed to be within an x, y, and z space. Right here. Yeah. Right here. Okay. Oh, I'll, yeah. This is. We'll get, we're going to separate this first as a group, so you can select that. And uh, if you hit spacebar, you get a quick command, right? Like a quick shortcut to many things. So this one right here is making a group, so we'll call this one like group number one. So. Uh, you mean like after on at the move, the steps? Okay. Oh, okay. Because they were in the air because the move uh, operator, the move component, defaulted to the z direction, and it defaulted a value of ten to the z direction. So it's because it only had one value, it applied that one value to every point. Once we give it a list of matching amount of values, right? We have five points and we have five values. It'll designate one value to each point, right? That's where we get to grafting where in grafting you're applying every value to every point right rather than one to one right so when we flatten we are kind of eliminating that separation you're creating so here is where you you know here you see like <coughs> i'll put points to points to compare right the points before all have a value for the y direction right and then those same points later on have all the same value for the y direction, but they have different values for the x direction. They've all been given the same value at the x direction. And that's what our grafting has done. When I flatten, I eliminate that separation of lists, right? So if you see here, this is our, this data tree, right? This component is called the param viewer. And if you right click, you can switch between uh, looking at 
the branches in text format, or you can see it as this way, right? So this is basically a representation of our first point, right? And then when it gets moved, it's starting to, to branch off into different lists that receive, you know, that now have different things applied to each list. So when I flatten, it brings everything back down to one list, right? And that polyline is no longer a polyline for every row, but it's one polyline of all the points. Do we get this? This is fundamental. Like if you get this part, basically any part of Grasshopper, no matter how complicated the operation is, whether it's surfaces or meshes, you'll be able to do complex modifications. This is like the math part of the program. And understanding that when you're creating inputs and we're, when you're adding these operations, you're working with lists of things, right? You're working with a certain amount of things. Um, so we're going to use the same example of using a series or uh, creating a list of numbers. And we're going to have something originate from each one of these points. So instead of a polyline, uh, we're going to go ahead and follow where our mug would have gone. So we're going to start with a circle. And here's the thing, right? Um, there's a bunch of ways to make circles, right? So you can either search circle, and then you can so I see like circle three point. Um, you know, circle C and R, circle tangent, whatever. And you see that they all have different inputs and they even have different outputs, right? So the good thing about this is whenever you're, you know, I would recommend, especially when you're starting out in Grasshopper, not to sit down and try to make something, right? More like sit down and see what could happen, right? So it's more like, okay, I have to create some type of circle. Rather than just going ahead and creating a circle, look at your options, right? So you can go to the curve tab, and under the curve tab, well, under any tab, you always have like these sections, right? The primitive section is always going to have like the simplest uh, forms, right? The simplest sort of things that you can use. So in this case, I already, uh, already took circle C and R, circle three point, or in circle, right? So we see that an in circle takes three corners and creates a circle within that. Circle C and R uses a center. A normal, which is, a normal is, remember we talked about vectors and then having a direction and a force? So a normal is basically the vector that represents the way a surface is facing, right? So if I'm looking at you guys this way, my normal is right here. If I turn this way, then my normal has become right here, right? So normal is basically which way do we want the circle to start facing. And as we can see, if I hover over it, I get one locally defined value, and again, it's represented in an X, Y, Z format. Does anybody, can you see that on the, up there? You see 0, 0, 1, right? And 1 is where Z would be, so it's defaulting to the Z direction. So we can understand that this circle is facing up by default, right? And then we have a radius. So I usually go for circle C and R. It gets the job done. Uh, so I'm going to plug in, I'm going to ungraph this just to show you again why that plays a role. All right, so we got a circle at every point, but we didn't get it at that other row point. That's because that other row point is our construct points, right? Which is giving Y coordinates. Because I started my move operation at two, Right? If I put it down to zero, then my start is right at the construct points. But because I put two, my whole grid is shifted. Or, yeah, because I put three, my whole grid is shifted three units in that direction. So by selecting on a component and hitting that spacebar menu, I can hide the construct points with this guy with the blindfold. Right? And now I can see, like, directly the working board. So we have... We have a total of 25 points, right? A grid by 5 by 5, right? But we only have, we, the lists are only separated in groups of 5, right? So right now, how my things are set up, because I have those separated in a list of 5s, I can't create a list of data to apply to all the circles. I can only do it to each row. Does that make sense? <coughs> so I'm going to create a random, right? We can use a random thing to just create random numbers. And I'm going to connect it to radius. Now we need a range. Now this is the part where Grasshopper just tells you what it needs, right? You can investigate 
And uh, you know, if you go up here on the surface and you want to start creating surfaces, anything you hover over, it's going to give you like a quick description, right? Extrude along, extrude curves and surfaces along a curve. All right, I already understand that I need either a, a curve or a surface and then another curve, right? You already start understanding what it means. So for random, we understand we need a range, right? And for range, it says domain of random numeric range, zero to one. So I'm just going to type range. And then range gives me what I need for right here. But then range needs a domain. So for domain, you can use construct domain, right? And this is basically setting up a lowest value and the highest value for that list of random numbers. So I'm going to go from 1 to, let's say, 5. Yeah, I should explain number slider real quick. So number sliders, you can do numbers a lot of different ways in this program. You can use a number slider by typing number slider, right? You'll get the, the default number slider. You can type in number, and you'll get this one from the... You can always recognize uh, the parameter components because they're just black icons. They're the only ones that are these black icons. So when you type in um, for a number, right, you're going to right-click and then you can set a number, right? Right-clicking will always give you information that let, uh, give you information or show you how you can modify that certain thing. Worst comes to worst, if you hover if you're hovering over it and then you're not getting what it needs or you're hovering over the inputs and you're still not understanding it, you can always hit help and it'll just give you like a quick rundown or a pretty comprehensive rundown of how that thing works, right? You can contact the developer and everything. So uh, then number sliders, right? This number slider, I typed in 1, right? So it went from 0 to 1. Those are my limits here. Had I typed 2, it would have gone from 0 to 10, right? Had I typed 11, it would have gone from 0 to 100, and so on. So rather than choosing the number that you want, I usually go, you know, if I understand I need from 0 to 100, I'll type 11. You now if I need from 0 to 10, I'll type in 2, and so on. But you can also double click any number slider and then you can edit it, right? Uh, you can create a maximum number, a minimum number, you can even make the minimum number uh, be negative. Uh, and then you can create decimal points by creating floating point numbers and decide how many decimal points you want. So with that, I get a lot more flexibility on what's going on on the left. And now what's happening, right? We're having a w overlap. Of input here right this point is getting too many radiuses that's that's why they're kind of like stacking up on here right so that's because out of here we're getting 11 values right rather than the five that we want we hover over number right and the the random component is only defining one value so the problem isn't here right the range component if I, if I hover over steps is giving me 10 Right, so that's where we identify the problem. So we can see that something weird's happening that shouldn't be happening, right? Because I haven't yet, uh, you know, you should finish putting in all your inputs before you decide that something's going wrong. But you can already, but I could already tell that you know something was off. So you can always hover and kind of track where your mistake's going. So I can see that here you can define the number of random values, but here it's set to one. So my problem isn't here over steps, the number of steps is set to 10. So my problem is here. So uh, again, I can create a number slider for this. I can create a number component for this. Or sometimes on an input, you can just right click it uh, like I did the number component and just set an integer straight into this component. So I'm going to set it to, actually, instead of setting it to 5 here, I'm going to do something interesting. Because say that over here, I change from the reason I have five points at all times is because I started here with the series of five points, right? So I can actually connect this number slider over to my steps over here, right? Even then I have one too many, right? So I'm going to use a subtraction. And like I was going to do here, I'm just going to set this to one, set B to one. And then bring 5 over to subtraction, right? I'm going to finish with the randomizer I was creating. So 
finish with the domain. So that domain is too big. Uh, I guess let's go to one. Okay, so I've created a range of numbers, and then seed. Uh, seed just means a different variation, right? So whenever you're like counting on something that's random, like here the seed is two. If I input a two, right, it's just gonna like change uh, the way those values are put in. I'm gonna scale everything up a little bit, so I'm gonna move from uh, seven to eight, and just kind of widen this out a little bit because my random isn't working. Uh, because my random isn't picking up decimals, right? So what I did was I just created more spacing so that, that way I can go up to six here. I'm still getting this mistake. I'm going to just leave that there. For, do you guys need to take a look at this for a little bit? Does everyone get everything so far? What's up? Sorry? Yeah? What, orange? That orange usually means... Well, you're missing a value. Orange means something's missing, right? So for the subtraction, I right-clicked on B to set a number there as 1. And then I brought in a number slider. Another number slider here is five. Now, there's some mathematical thing. I'm not really picking up on why it's happening, but. It seems that as I increase the number of points, I'm increasing the amount of values that are overlapping. So rather than look into that right now, uh, I'm just going to go ahead and put a number slider to steps. That's going to give me what I want. There you go. Yeah. It'd be nice to have things interconnect that way, but and you can investigate and see how you can make it work. But right now, in terms of speed, I'm just going to go ahead and put a number slider myself to, to make it work. OK. So we have a random outputs, right? But there's something strange about the way the numbers are relating to the circles, right? And then we go back to what we were talking about, right? So here I have that list of points that we had talked about. This is actually over here already. This is the list of points that we had talked about where each one, each row has the same Y, right? And then they all have this different amount applied to their X direction. And then over here, what you can see is that I have, also here are the indexes for the list, right? So this is list zero. And this is item zero and list zero, right? List one, and this is item zero and list one, and so on. So here I have a list of five, right? Because it starts counting from zero. So I have five lists, and there I have five points. So what's basically happening is this first value, right, for the radius, is being applied to the first one in every list, right? So this first radius, this itty-bitty like 0.362 is being applied, because it's first, is being applied to the first one in each one, right? The second value is being applied to the second and so on. So in this case, the, the list indexes are matching, right? So uh, list zero uh, is applying its number, its, right, this number with index zero to every other zero from the other list. Right? And then it's applying everything from list 1 to every, every index of number 1 in every list. Right? If I were to flatten this right, and make it four values, now the orientation has changed right, in the way it becomes larger, simply because now 
it's going by row, right? So rather than, um, I feel like I need to draw. Am I confusing people? Is this getting a little complicated or? Yeah? Right. Let's take a moment. <laughs> You know what? I'm going to bring back the polyline. Okay, so you remember when I brought these points to, as a polyline? Each row is a separate list, so then it's creating a line for that list, right? In that direction. So, what's happening right now with the radiuses? This is one row, right? So this row right here, the first one, is this list, right? Right here, this first list. So this point, point number six, is the last point, right? So it's having a value of five earlier, right? It's being moved in that direction. Now it's being, now it has a radius of five to the third, right? So you're going to this. Once we get this done, we'll get into some more exciting stuff. But this is important to me. So. Um, so as we said, that point right there, and so that row, that line drew, that row is this list right here. Right? And so this list, is this one, right? The next Yeah. So now what's happening is this is a single list of values being applied to radius, right? So this first value is being applied to the first one of each row, right? Of each row. So this one, this value with index zero is going to the point with index zero. To the point with index zero the point with index zero, right? And every point with an index of zero, we can understand is the beginning, right? Of every list. And we understand that this is the beginning because it's a small circle and it's on this polyline, right? And we know that every polyline is a separate list. Yeah. So that's because I flattened the random list that the numbers are being applied that way, right? Do we get that? Do we get what's happening in Grasshopper and why it's happening in Rhino in that way? Okay. So when I when I don't flatten the random values, now the values are in separate lists, right? Now instead of being like uh, a list of zero, right, with index is from zero to five, right? Rather than having that, now every value has an index of zero, and rather they're list, right? Now they're separate lists. So the orientation of how the circles get bigger has changed, right? So instead of every first one being the small one, the first list of points has all the small circles, right? The next list of points has all the next ones, right? So what that means is, and now this first value is being applied to the entire first list, right? And then the next list, right, is being applied to the next set of points, right? So rather than the index is lining up, the list indexes are lining up. Yes? Okay. This one, well, yeah, okay, so you see how this wire right here, is, yeah, that means that uh, there's more than one value being carried through, but it's a single list. When you have the dash line, it means there's uh, separate lists. So you can infer that the dash line means that it's grafted and that uh, the bottom line is flat. Alright, this is the hard part.
we got over the complicated part of Grasshopper. If you can understand this, even like 60-70%, you're good. <laughs> Trust me. So we're going to get into something now a little bit more, you know, kind of to show off what you can do in Grasshopper that's still very simple. And we're going to use the same sort of principles that we've gone through so far. I'm going to bring the screen back down. Do we have any more questions on this before I move on? I can't stress how important it is that you get this. No? Okay. Um, yeah, yeah. But uh, what we'll do also is, okay, so it's 11 now. We, that means we've gone through almost an hour. So what I'm going to do is over the next 20 minutes, I'm going to do... And I'm going to do an example, right? I'm going to go a little bit faster. You're not really, if you can follow along, great. If you fall behind, just pay attention, right? You're going to get this file. You're going to get this recording. So it's really important that you just like see and try to understand as best as you can on how to navigate the program and stuff. So now we're going to get into uh, more complex curve systems uh, and generating surfaces from that. So I'm going to save this one as... This is again Okay. So new file. All right. So we're going to start this out in a similar way. <clears throat> Sorry. I'm going to start with a construct point. Sorry, the reason why I brought up that we're going into another example now. I'll go through this example in the next like 20 minutes. I'll try to quickly show you um, how I've applied Grasshopper in my projects and what the applications can be, where to look for plugins and stuff. And then I'll stay up until 12. Uh, if you have any more questions on your computer, I can help you out or we can go over something else. Um, so we'll be done around close to 11.30, maybe a little past 11.30. I'll stick around until 12 for those of you that want to take a little bit more time. Um, okay. So we are starting with a construct point, and rather than modifying the axis, I'm going to go straight into creating a grid. Well, not creating a grid. Sorry, I'm going to go about this again. Uh, I'm going to move along the y direction and set up number slider for that. When I'm doing something fairly simple um, that I know I can keep track of in my head, I like to put all my number sliders on the left of the document, right? And if you double click every number slider, you can title it. So here I'm just gonna say um, curve length, right? And if I title every number slider, then once I created the whole process, I can edit the entire form through here, right? Generally speaking. Okay. So I want to create some type of wave. So in my head, I've already determined like this curve is going to be generated between this point and the next, right? So I have a separation of 35 between one and the other. Uh, now I'm going to look at the curve and see kind of what I could go for. So oh. <clears throat> we have spline. Let's see. Okay, construct a Bezier span from endpoints and tangents. Sounds complicated, isn't at all. So our starting point would be the construct point, right? And our end point would then be this next one. Right, now it needs two tangents and it's letting me know. Input, parameter, start tangent, fail to collect data. So I need both tangents, right? So, yeah? Which, which one? Bezier span. I found it over here under curve and under spline. It's the first one right here. Bezier span. So, a tangent. Does anyone know how to how tangents work? 
uh, I'm going to draw it over here. Basically, if I have this line, right, from one point to the next, a tangent defines how a line meets a circle, right? So when you're defining a tangent for this line of 3, right, you're basically saying that there's a circle with a radius of 3 existing here, right, and then the curve is generated that way, right? So when you're having two tangents, what I'm going to do is I'm going to create that line, right? I'm going to take a point, two points from that line, and I'm going to push one in one direction and one in the other to create my tangent. And then I'll end up with something like that. Right? Or actually, well, depends on this. So, I got my Bezier span, I understand I need those inputs, but I need to do some middle work, right? So I'm going to shift this over to the right. Oh yeah, when you're dragging stuff, you know, you can put it anywhere you want, but if you want things to like line up, you can hold shift and it'll move, you yeah. You could even, right, if I have this like this and I select the two, I get these sort of options on the side. So this one right here, oh, why does it get smaller? I can't show you it. But you get, yeah. Mr. Sparkle. I've never seen that. But basically it'll align them, right? So you see that? Um, okay, so let's create these tangents. So let's do that line I was talking about. So I type in line. Create a line between two points. Sorry? Curved length. I haven't used that one. Either. Okay. So on the line, then I'm going to use point on curve. Right? And from point on curve, I'm going to copy and paste it because I want to. Right? And so here I'm going to right click. And I can select one third, and then I can select two thirds, right? Or I can slide to this one. Point on curve. That's what this one is. Point on curve. All right. So now I have the beginning of my two tangents, but as I was saying, to create this effect, I'm starting to move these points in the z direction, right? So I'm gonna move that first one down. Right? And remember we talked about number sliders. I'm going to do one from 0 to 100. I'm going to double click it. And I'm going to make it go to negative 50. And this way, I can have the number slider move the point downwards as well as upwards. Right? So, there we go. Right? I'm going to hide these point on curves. And just go ahead and copy this. Now, this is what I would do, right? If I wanted, oh, and then I have to. Okay. So for those of you that kind of missed it, I did the point on curve, right? From this line I created between the two points, right? Point on curve, and then I moved each. I created a move component for each point, right? With a number slider that goes into the negative. So. It goes up and it goes down. So when I connect these now as my tangents, right? Starting to get a curve that looks pretty funky. Right? Uh, let's see. I can't see it. Is it okay if I do this? Does it? Are we still good? <laughs> Throws me off. But. Okay, so now when I move these points, right, either along the, the curve, right, or up and down, I can modify that curve, right? Um, now, say that I wanted the tangents to relate to each other, instead of creating a negative number slider, what I can do is I can use the same number slider and the same direction, but add a negative component, right? the same number to the different point 
right? Do you get that? It's the same thing that's carrying through, only I'm putting it through a negative here, so it's inverting those points, right? Trippy. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and do a sweep. So a sweep is one way to create a surface. Um, you can use sweep one or sweep two. The difference is really simple. Like if you're gonna, uh, if you're gonna create a, a tunnel, right? You have like you have a cross section, right? And then you have a rail, so a curve that's gonna kind of follow. So the cross section is gonna follow the rail, right? And kind of create a surface like that. So that's what I'm going to do with that curve uh, for the sake of saving time rather than creating another tangent curve or another funky curve. I'm going to actually I need to show you this, this to you guys. So I'm going to select the this Bezier span I did, right? I'm going to hit that quick menu and this fried egg bakes the stuff from Grasshopper that I have selected into Rhino. So if I bake this curve, I can now have this curve inside Rhino, right? The reason why I want to do that now is because I'm going to do another curve just to draw it really quickly because it doesn't really matter. And I can do the inverse, right? So remember in the parameters tab, I told you this stuff interprets data that you're working with. So I can type curve, right, and select the parameter curve component. Set one curve and then click that curve. And now I have that curve in Rhino. I could even right click it and hit internalize data, right? And now I can delete that curve and it's not referencing anymore, right? It's standalone. But if I don't delete it and I don't internalize it, uh, if I move it, it's gonna move in Grasshopper too, right? So the reason why I want it here is because it's because these they're matching, right? The reason why I baked it was to start right there so that my sweep will work. So in my sweep, I'm going to use this as my cross section and this as my rail. So that makes no sense, but it looks pretty cool. Now I'm going to use a plugin because I could show you the analog way of doing this, but why do that when a plugin makes it easier, right? Uh, so there's a plugin called Lunchbox that I use quite a lot uh, that does, this is basically paneling tools, like surface treatments. So I go into the paneling section and I'll select, I don't know, pick one of you guys. Hexagons? So remember I told you that, what's going on, oh, what is going on, hello, uh, I don't know what's happening, okay, alright, remember I told you that uh, surfaces have a U and a V definition, right, sort of a division in either way, so what this plugin does is it takes that information and creates a pattern on the surface based on uh, how that surface is interpreted, right? So if I connect this surface here, we can see that the U divisions are, de are uh, defaulted to 10. Oh, BREP uh, basically means anything that has some sort of surface type uh, parameters, anything that's not a mesh or a curve, basically, right? So a BREP can be a closed poly surface, a single surface, an open poly surface, so on and so forth. So forth, sorry. So if I connect that right here, I get that hexagonal pattern, right? And go through that surface. If I, why is this so weird, bro? I'm gonna hide everything else. So I just see that. So it could be a little confusing. I'm trying to get like a good view of it, but, but you get it, right? You have a hexagonal pattern like being placed on that surface, so. What we're going to do now is um, we're going to scale this. So hexagonal cells, right? 
and then I see 61 curves. So I can infer here is that not the hexagons aren't part of just all one curve, right? The way it's being described here, hexagonal cells, closed polyline cells, and a bunch of and 61 polyline curves, right? I can basically infer that every hexagon is its own standalone curve, right? Which means I can modify each cell individually. So if I were to scale it, right, and I scale all the hexagonal cells, that happens. But that's because my center is defaulting to 0, 0, 0. It's defaulting to the construct point, to the origin point. So basically this entire structure is scaling towards the origin point. But here I have 61 centers corresponding to 61 cells. Right? So following the same logic as before with the points, if I connect the centers here, it's going to scale each cell within its own. Right? Now I can create a ruled surface, which is a surface between two curves, and I can do it between the inner one and the outer one. Right? And now I have... I'm going to clean up this curve because I don't like this going on. Uh, yeah. Where's my curve? Here it is. Center. That's better. I think. And then you can go back and you can add or take away divisions. So you can actually push this to be much more complicated. The reason why it's going pretty slowly is because I have I'm creating surfaces, right? If this were just curves, it would be much faster. Right? And kind of create this surface treatment. I see. So as you can see, the way that these curves are relating to each other is kind of like inverted of what I would like. So I could actually take this curve right here and say, okay, how can I fix this, right? I know how to fix it, but I'm going to go into curve and go into uh, util, right? And this basically helps you reinterpret what you're working with. And in util, we have a component called flip curve. What is flip curve. So if I flip the curve, nope, that didn't do it. What I'm gonna do, I didn't do it. I don't know. I'm not happy with how this is looking, but you get it, right? You get the idea. You get how this is going now. So, from a ruled surface, you can even give it thickness by extruding in a certain direction, or right. Let's say. Actually, let's let's do this real quick. Um, also, in that little quick menu when you hit spacebar, I showed you guys the grouping and the baking and the previewing. But this switch on the right activates or deactivates that component. So if you don't want to delete it, or you don't want to disconnect it, you can deactivate it, right? So now the ruled surface is still there, but it's just not operational. It's not taking away any computer power. What I'm going to do is I'm going to move this... Um, these scaled ones, right? I'm going to move them in the way that they're facing so that every single cell, right? So you have a, kind of if I have like every cell have a scaled thing move in the direction that it's facing, right? So that that way, when I do the ruled surface, rather than filling in this area right here, I would create so what we can do there is the cells, right? We'd have to turn the cells from curves to surfaces. So what I'm going to do is just a boundary surface, understanding that every cell is just a closed polyline, right? Connecting the cells to there. What? This has never happened before. That's why I don't like that curve. 
I'm just gonna sweep it in a straight line. I'm gonna stop being careful. Okay. So we can tell that the issue isn't with that curve, but rather with the the span that we did earlier. So we can actually try and see it's taking a lot of a lot to process, so you just deactivate things that you don't need. Decrease the amount of divisions for now. Yeah, if you double click where the number is, you can uh, you can just type in the number that you need. Okay, now I'm getting an issue that makes no sense when I reactivated it, right? That can happen sometimes. So you can hit spacebar, and then down here you have a recompute. So it'll just run the whole thing again, and I'm still getting an error. Hmm. And it's because of how this curve is set up. Hmm. Well, anyway, you can see how the entire thing can be edited. Oh. Yeah, I don't know why. This should be working. I don't know why it's not. Instead of the hexagonal ones, I'm going to go for just a normal one just to see. Just to get that point across. Sometimes things will not really work and you won't really be able to tell why. Like, I've had files that have frustrated me, like, so much. And then I open it and for no reason, that time it works how it should, you know. It's just computer stuff. Um, but okay, actually here I'm creating the surfaces straight away, so I don't need to do the boundary that I was doing earlier. Um, so I can do evaluate face, right? And I know this, but you can always go into surface analysis, right? And this way you're working way backwards, right? So when you would be saying, oh, if I wanted to make a surface face this way, I need to find a surface component that'll take a curve and an orientation or a radius, right? Instead, you can have a surface and you can deconstruct it, right? So here in the analysis tab, I can get the evaluate surface. And that's going to give me the normal, the way that that surface is facing. But I need the surface and I also need a point on the surface. But super easy because the area component gives me the area of each panel which is data that I can then use to inform something else and the center of every surface so all that that you're seeing is just uh, a representation of all the vectors all the ways that those forces are or those faces are facing so don't worry about that um, but so now I can move the scaled versions right if I connect their centers here and just make sure that's working yeah so that's working so now here evaluate surface I have the normal I have the, the direction that all these things are facing right and over here I have all these inset things I want those inset things to move away from their surface so I need to create a move but rather than going to an X Y or Z direction I have to set an individual direction for every surface but it's so easy because of the way the data is set up. So we have 324. That's not right. Or oh, I guess it is. Yeah. I'm going to make the light one. Once you start seeing big numbers for no reason, like, you know, you can finish your entire process and then go back and make it more complicated. But if I have 324 surfaces and I'm testing what I want to do, it's just going to crash my computer at some point. Um, Alright, so we need to translate these the way that these things are facing to a direction, right? So we know we're working with vectors. So we can go to the vector tab and we can look around for something. I know exactly what I'm looking for. It's amplitude. So set the amplitude of a vector. So this basically sets a force uh, or a value, right, to a direction. So my direction is the normal, the way that that face is looking, right? And then my amplitude is a number, so I'm just going to go, well, I'm going to type 11. So this is where it gets interesting, right? Because you're going to get a plug-in to, 
to take in uh, solar information or any other type of information, then you can have that data feed how much these things are actually moving away or how much they're offsetting, how much they're opening. Um, that's actually something I covered in the first workshop that I didn't have time to do in this one, but it would have gotten really complicated. Um, let me finish the example and then I'll get into that. But yeah, you get it, right? All these things are now moving in the direction that they're facing. And when I do the ruled surface now, if I do it from the moved ones, I'm doing it from scale to scale, right? That's not what. That's why it's not working. So I have to go back to the panels, and there we go, right? So now I have those openings, and now it's something really repetitive, really complicated to model. But if you understand that you have a list of objects and a list of values that they need to correlate, you need to kind of inform each other, then it becomes really simple, right? Um, so there's some things I went over in this workshop that I didn't do on Wednesday. On Wednesdays, what I went over was basically uh, if you're calculating distances or if you have any sort of calculation, right? Let's say you're calculating radiation. The radiation a surface can receive, right, which basically is just saying the amount of heat uh, or energy that surface is receiving from the sun, uh, can be anywhere between like 20 rads and like 4,000, right? But how do you translate to that to inches and feet, right? So you would take... Uh, if you guys want to write this down, look up the remap, um, remap component. And uh, basically following that same process that we did with the random one, remember? Random needed a range, and then range needed to construct a domain. You'll figure out the remap one also. So the remap is really useful for doing that, for taking data that isn't necessarily, you know, directly inputted, but you can scale it, right? So if you have from 20 rads to 4,000, I can have 20 rads mean an inch of an opening and 4,000 rads be four inches of an opening, right? And then the entire variation is still there, it's just scaled to the constraints that you need it. Um, Thanks for watching. Hopefully, you found that helpful. Uh, and again, if you didn't, please let me know in the comment section below how uh, I can elaborate to better help you. Next week, I'll be coming out with the. Next week, I'll be coming out with a video that goes over the very basics of the Grasshopper interface. The reason why I wanted to put this video out first was because uh, the people that attended the workshop depend on this video to get their projects along. Thanks again for watching and I'll see you guys next week. In the comments in the, the, uh, oh my god. I hope you guys find this video helpful. Oh my god. Okay, 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 okay. Ah!